We begin as we always do by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thanking Him. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala infinitely and abundantly. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by night and by day. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ease and we thank Allah jalla jalaluh in difficulty. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the things that we may often consider to be small blessings. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the magnificence of those that we deem to be large and grand amongst His blessings. We thank Allah Ta'ala for the greatest of all of those blessings, which is that He has chosen you and I to be from the people of La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And every moment, every second of existence within the realm of La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah is a moment of gratitude that we can never be thankful enough for. And so we thank Allah Ta'ala for that. And that is manifested even greater in the month of Ramadan. To be chosen not only to be a believing man and woman, not only to be in a gathering of remembrance, which is huge, but on top of that, to be selected to live in the most beautiful and sacred and blessed of days. And so we thank Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala for that. We ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala to make us from the followers and the lovers of the one sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was most thankful. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us thankful like him. To make us beautiful like him. To make us brilliant like him. And just to make us like him. Until we meet him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of this just to say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah, the crowd goes wild. I'm just joking. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu Akbar. It's always a second shot with, uh, with the Michigan community when, when everyone wakes up. Allahu Akbar. Uh, you know, uh, SubhanAllah, I was driving here and I was laughing. And my brother, like, he always says, why do you like creepily laugh in the middle of us driving uh, from Chicago? And I told him, SubhanAllah, like, not only has Michigan become home, but if a Thursday passes that I'm not in Michigan, I start to, like, panic. Like, what am I doing today? Like, I need to, I need to go to check up on my family in Michigan. So I am so grateful and blessed and fortunate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have this opportunity uh, with Miftah Institute. Although we are kind of like a generic version of Thabat right now. I messaged, uh, I messaged uh, Ustaz Tariq and I was like, listen, I'm sitting in your chair. We got the rugs, we're fully, we're fully stealing your vibe. We just have like a generic Tariq for everyone. Um, and uh, all of this is tahyi'a and tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to be here. And the idea is that, subhanAllah, these gatherings of Ramadan can never be overlooked. And one of the things that we often overlook in the month of Ramadan is that we, we spend a lot of Ramadan really focusing and analyzing how we can maximize reward. And yet the reality that Imam Al-Ghazali ta'ala tells us is Ramadan is in many ways like a mirror. And this is powerful. Because if Ramadan is a mirror, then you know when like you got dressed to come here today, you might have looked in the mirror, and for me, like I'm always adjusting my hat, I'm always making sure that my thobe looks, looks at least decent with my socks, making sure that things are flowing together. And if we don't have those moments, they feel like moments of subtlety, but at the reality is those moments make a magnificent difference. And Ramadan is exactly that, it's a mirror when we get to look at ourselves in a way that we wouldn't know the reality of how we are spiritually presenting ourselves if we didn't have that time in front of the mirror. And so Ramadan is in front of that mirror. And one of the things that many of us will notice as we stand in front of the mirror of Ramadan is that there is a whole lot of adjustments that need to be made. It's not just a hat. It's not just a, a, a bad hijab day. It's a whole lot of work that needs to be done. And one of the areas of work that Ramadan really highlights is that we are a people that struggle with dua. We really are a people that very oftentimes find us struggling with dua. One of the brothers just a few days ago, he's like, Tariq, tell me to do anything. Tell me to donate a thousand dollars. Tell me to read an entire juz every day of Ramadan. I'll, I got you on that. But tell me to raise my hands in dua and be vulnerable with Allah and I won't even know where to begin. It's like you become like a deer in headlights, unable to really move forward in your conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so in the spirit of that, 
I was talking to Mufti Abdul Wahab, Hafizahullah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and reward him and all the muftis and the mashayikh of Miftah. And I said, you know what? It would be a good idea to explore the ad'iyah, the dua of the awliya, and particularly the prophets and the messengers. And wallahi, it is such, a, such a, an insightful experience to sit with each and every single one of their ad'iyah. And the reason why that is so important is because, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to be asked. And that is very different when you draw a comparison between the creation and the creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to be asked. And what, what angers Allah, what frustrates Allah, what disappoints Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not being asked. And many of us, in the spirit of being shy with Allah, in the spirit of being embarrassed with Allah, we don't ask. Because it feels like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already done so much for us, so how dare I ask for more? When in the reality, the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such that asking Him allows Him not only to give us more, and this is important, but asking Allah allows Him to love you more. And who wishes not to be loved more by Allah? You know, and, uh, and even a mother, and no one, the closest thing that we have to divine love in the dunya is the love of a mother for her child. And to some degree, a mother loves to be prioritized by her child to be the one that the child asks, right? And yet, subhanAllah, even the mother, with this divinely unique love that she has innately for her child, even the mother struggles. Like one of the most uh, magnified traits of a mother is burnout. Because at some point of time, no matter how much she loves her child, she struggles to be able to give from the same vessel of herself to her child, even if she wishes to, even if she loves to. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Al-Imam ibn Abdul Bar rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, Inna Allah yuhibbu an yus'al. Allah loves to be asked. Not only does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love to be asked, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deems it disrespectful unbecoming and unacceptable for those who have faith in Him to not ask of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you know why? Because one who doesn't ask Allah it is an indication of them not truly knowing Allah. Because if we know Allah haqqa ma'rifatihi, if we know Allah for who He truly is, we wouldn't be able to ask anyone but Allah. إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِمْ بِاللَّهِ If you ask, ask Allah. And if you seek help, seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reality of that dua is it becomes, subhanAllah, cognitively, that I ask Allah and then I just watch Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do what He does. I take the asbab, but the asbab no longer become the issues of codependence or overdependence on people. It's that I've asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and now I'm moving forward with my journey and in a way where I am not overly dependent on any of His creations, I'm just witnessing Allah ta'ala do what He subhanahu wa ta'ala does. And that's why one of the scholars, he says, مِنْ عَلَامَاتِ الْإِجَابَةِ أَنْ يُوَفِّكَكَ اللَّهِ لِلْدُعَاءِ if you want to see a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to answer you, it is in fact in the fact that you made dua in and of itself. Simply the fact that you're making dua is a sign that Allah ta'ala will answer your dua. There's, I, there is no creation that doesn't need. There is no creation that is free of uh, needs and voids and pain and difficulty. Yet how many people do we know that need a job and don't ask Allah Ta'ala for a job? How many people are in need of food and they don't turn to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala in need of that sustenance or nourishment? So simply Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala guiding us to be a people who call upon Him for our needs, that is a sign that Allah Ta'ala is ready to answer us. It is a sign of tawfiq from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala that we even ask for that dua. But then, Al-Imam Abdullah ibn Muhammad, he continues and he says, وَلَكِنَ الدُّعَاءَ لَا يَكُونُ مِنْ طَرَفِ اللِّسَانِ And that is the entire spirit of this series. Is that we want to transition, my dear brothers and sisters, from a dua that's like mechanical, from a dua that seems haphazardly done, 
from a dua that may be done out of obligation or out of reverence to a dua that is, intim that is indicative of an intimately near and vulnerable connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's the track records of the prophets of Allah. Is that they made dua to Allah because Allah was that close to them. Yes, But not only was Allah close to them by His will, but they were close to Allah by their will. See what it is? It's not only that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is near to us because that's the trait of Allah. But it is that we conscientiously and mindfully choose to be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so they say, they say, وَلَكِنَ الدُّعَاءِ لَا يَكُونُ مِنْ طَرَفِ اللِّسَانِ بَلْ لَا بُدَّ أَنْ يَصْدُرْ مِنْ صَمِيمَ الْقَلْبِ That the reality of a dua is it doesn't just flow from the tip of the tongue, it actually comes from the depths of the heart. I want you to try right now to say Astaghfirullah three times. And by the third time, I want us to try to bring it out from the core of our hearts. Let's try that for a moment. So much so that we go to Sayyidina Adam السلام, and we hear him saying, Oh Allah, if you do not forgive me, then I am nothing but a loser. So to make dua as simple, as simple of a dua as Astaghfirullah, to say it three times and by the third time to make sure that, dua, that the dua transcends from being at the, at the tip of the lips to sitting in the chest, maybe by the second time sitting in the chest, but by the third time to say Astaghfirullah and feel it coming from the depths of your heart. Let's practice that for a moment. And you'll notice something that happens. And that is that by the time you make your third istighfar, your third time asking Allah to forgive you, what do you want to do? You want to ask a fourth time, and a fifth time, and a sixth time, because the ask is becoming more real. That the talab, the essence of your calling upon Allah, is becoming more alive. And you wanting Allah to become, uh, you wanting Allah to forgive you, becomes something that you feel not only is a lip service, but is an action of the heart. And that is my favorite translation of what dua is. It's a call of the heart. It's a call of the heart, not a call of the tongue. It's a call that begins from the heart. And that's why. Al-Imam Al-Allama Abdullah ibn Muhammad rahimahullah He says, number one, the sign of istijabah that Allah is going to answer your dua is that Allah Ta'ala guided you from to dua that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala allowed you to feel the need to ask Allah for whatever it is that you need to ask for but the second thing is that you are able to get the dua not just to come from the tongue but for the dua to penetrate past the tongue to go through the throat, to go into the chest, to reach the chambers of your heart. And from the chambers of your heart, you say, Ya Allah, forgive me. Ya Allah, love me. Ya Allah, help me. Ya Allah, guide me. That the chambers of your heart are connecting with Allah through your dua. And that is when we begin to feel that the heart is actually connecting to Allah. And that's why he says, من علامات حي القلوب and from the signs of a heart that is alive is that when you're in your dua you know how when you stand up in prayer you, you make a conscious choice to face the qibla a dua that is impactful and effective it's like your heart was facing your career your heart was facing that person you want to marry your heart was facing your children that you're so consumed by and now your heart turns and your heart is facing Allah and the heart is directed to Allah when you're in your dua. And no matter what you're talking about, your heart is like facing the qibla of Allah Ta'ala 
when you're calling upon him and this is a sign of an accepted dua. And that's why subhanAllah the scholars they say when you begin to make dua, you ask yourself, what is the qibla of my heart right now? What is the direction of my heart right now? And to make sure that it is facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he continues and he says, فَاللَّهُ لَا يَخِيبْ دُعَاءَهُ وَلَا يَرُدَّهُ That the one who is turning to Allah and has been facilitated to be making dua, and it's not just coming from the tongue, it's not even coming from the chest, it's coming from the chambers of the heart, and the heart is facing Allah. What does it mean for the heart to be facing Allah? For the heart to be facing Allah, it means, Ya Allah, what I really want in this ask is not the job that I'm asking for. What I really want from this ask is not even the spouse that I'm asking for. Why I want that job, why I want that spouse, why I want that house, why I want that car, why I want everything I'm asking for. Ya Allah, really what I want through these asks is you. That the actual ghaya, the actual goal of the dua is, is, is to attain my relationship and my connection with you subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that becomes the essence of the dua. And then he says, and when that happens, Allah ta'ala does not reject. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not turn away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never allows, and he references the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, never does the faqir, the miskeen, raise their hands to Allah like a needy person, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them what they want and more. And in return, not only that, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pushes away the trials and tribulations, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings forward goodness that the servant of Allah wants. And that's why the dua that I wanted us to begin with from the ad'iyah of the prophets and the messengers is in fact the dua of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam. When I referenced that brother who when I was talking to him he said, you know, charge me a thousand dollars a day in Ramadan. I said, I'm going to take you up on that. I'm going to charge you a thousand dollars a day in Ramadan. He says, anything but, but no dua. And I told him like, why no dua? He said, Tariq, it's just so awkward. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's been so long and there's just so much damage. There's so much sin. There's so much wrong. There's so much that needs to be cleaned up. Remember we talked about Ramadan being that mirror? Sometimes you look in that mirror and you're like, man, I just got to change the whole outfit. I got to change everything that's presenting right here. Sometimes when we look at Ramadan as a mirror for our soul, we're like, man, like, can I do like an alt-delete type of thing on my soul? Because there's just too much that needs to be done. And in fact, the reality of dua is dua is actually the closest thing that we have to uh, 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 an undo or an alt-delete of our actual soul. Because dua says, here I am as I am, and yet, ya, ya Allah, you said you would accept me like this. And so the best story that I thought we could begin with is actually the story of Sayyidina Adam salam. Because Sayyidina Adam salam's dialogue as a devout with Allah begins where? Begins where we're all trying to go. It begins in Jannah. You see, people fall into sin for two reasons. People fall into sin because they're a little bit too comfortable in the prosperity that they're in. You know, you kind of have it made. You got the job, you have the friends, you have the money, you have the affluence, you have the clout. Everything is kind of sorted out for you, so you become too comfortable in the dunya. And when, 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 when we began to witness the atrocities of Gaza, I asked, my, I asked my teacher, how can we make sense of this? He says, he, he told me, he says, Tariq, we are an ummah that has been comfortable for far too long. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed us to witness things that make us uncomfortable in the midst of the prosperity and luxury that we live in. Because prosperity can sometimes lead an individual to disobedience and distance from Allah. And then the other thing that happens is sometimes the human being becomes weak and vulnerable to sin, not because they're in an extreme amount of prosperity that makes them lazy and kind of uh, uh, relaxed in terms of obedience of Allah, but it's actually the opposite extreme. That we have, we're facing a lot of heat. We're facing the way of a mother who's diagnosed with cancer. 
we're facing the weight of a challenging time financially or the ending of a marriage, and that pressure, the pressure of the fitna, the pressure of the trials and tribulations, it weighs on us so heavily that what begins to happen? Our iman begins to crumble, and as a result of our iman crumbling, what happens? The dua and the devotion to Allah begins to fade away. Sayyidina Adam السلام, is actually in a unique position because most prophets, we see them, are being tested with trials and tribulations of difficulty, not trials and tribulations of ease. And yet Adam السلام, in the garden, is he being tested with the fitna of ease or being tested with the fitna of difficulty? Which one is he being tested with? Not only ease, it's the ease that we're yearning for. It's the, it's the ease that we're craving for. He is living in Jannah. He's living in the place that has what no eye has ever seen, what no ear has ever heard. That the human being cannot even begin to dream of the beauties of Jannah. Brothers and sisters, Adam was there reaping Jannah like it was his defaulted home. So much so that the only thing that he was missing was companionship. And he went to Allah Ta'ala and he asked for companionship. And not only did Allah grant him the companionship of Hawa, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala gave him Hawa from himself. Like it's prosperity upon prosperity upon prosperity. And yet what do we realize happens when there is a tremendous amount of prosperity at times? That the human in the midst of all of this prosperity, what happens when we live in ultimate prosperity? Sometimes our guards go down and we become a little bit too comfortable and complacent. Clearly Allah is happy with me. If Allah wasn't happy with me, He wouldn't do all of these things for me. So our guards go down. And Sayyidina Adam السلام, had his guards go down for just a brief moment. But that brief moment of his guards going down was enough time for shaitan to what, do what? for shaitan to break through and to lay down the whispers that led Adam السلام, living in Jannah, the place that we yearn to be in, to eat from the only... You just have to process this for a moment. There's too many analogies and not enough time to go through them. For Sayyidina Adam السلام, to eat from the only tree in all of Jannah that he wasn't supposed to eat from. The only tree in all of Jannah, the vastest and most beautiful and remarkable of gardens, to eat from the only single tree he wasn't supposed to eat from. And he's Adam السلام, a prophet of Allah, who spoke directly to Allah, who was fashioned by Allah in a way that no other human being was. And he ate from that tree. That brother that I asked, why not talk to Allah? He said, because I can't get over how much I've screwed up with Allah. How much better I should be with Allah. Adam السلام, was living in the Jannah that we yearn for. And he ate from the only tree in Jannah that he wasn't supposed to eat from. And yet what did he refuse to do? He refused to give up on Allah. And that is the first lesson that we take from the dua of devotion is when you fall short with someone that you love, there are two psychological responses that a person can have. When you fall short with your wife or with your husband or with your children, there are two responses that you can have. One of them is a healthy response, the other is a toxic response. The healthy response is if I fall short with my mother, I lean into my love for my mother. The toxic response is I lean out of my relationship with her. For many of us, when we fall short with Allah, our response is toxic. We lean out of our relationship with Allah instead of into our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Adam alayhi salam, the minute he's sitting in Jannah, the minute he finds that he ate from the tree, and not only did he eat from the tree, but his spouse ate from the tree, that the first thing that he does is he says what? Rabbana. We don't even need to go past this word. He says, Rabbana, Ya Allah, even though in this moment, because in moments of sin, what did we really truly forget? Dear brothers and sisters, 
never does a, never does a believing woman and man sin except that the reality of their situation is in that moment of sin to some capacity they forgot Allah and the minute Adam السلام, ate from that tree some of the scholars they say the food had not even sat in his stomach yet the first word response that he did was Rabbana he remembered Allah because that sin only happened because we forgot him some of you might be like I'm a Muslim I was born Muslim I know Allah I'm named Abdullah I don't forget Allah brothers and sisters I'm not talking about intellectually or cognitively forgetting Allah I mean for your heart for your soul to tremble to such a degree that for that brief moment you forgot and I forget the reality of who Allah is. Otherwise, the servants of Allah would never delay a prayer. Otherwise, the servants of Allah would never look at haram. Otherwise, the servants of Allah would never raise their voice over their parents and be disrespectful to their spouse and children. Those moments of sin only happen because even when the mind that we are so impressed with even when the mind cognitively registers that there is an Allah, sometimes the heart, sometimes the soul is unable to recognize the reality of Allah. And the word Rabbana is a reminder to the soul and a reminder to the heart that Allah is my Rabb. Allah is my Rabb. What does it mean that Allah is my Rabb? We can give a whole series just on rububiyyatillah, what it means for Allah Ta'ala to be your Rabb. As you've been here during this time, tolerating my poor dad jokes, during that time, your eyes have blinked more times than you can count, or more times than you can imagine counting. Your heart, we don't know or have guesstimations of how many times your heart has been beating in this time. You also don't know the mother that you left at home, the family that you leave behind when you're here, the friends that you haven't spoken to for months, maybe even years, but you trust that they are okay. We only do that because Allah is our Rabb. Because Allah is our Rabb. Allah being our Rabb means that Allah is our caretaker, our provider, and our sustainer. And if Allah Ta'ala were to stop being my Rabb and your Rabb for just to withdraw from that, my brother and sister, for even a moment, وَلَا تَكِلْنِي إِلَى نَفْسِي طَرْفَةً Oh Allah, do not leave me to myself even for the blinking of an eye. What were to happen if Allah were to leave us for just the blinking of an eye? My Sheikh commented, he says, the eye would not blink if Allah stopped being our Rabb. But Allah never stops being my Rabb and yours. And Sayyidina Adam السلام, ate from that tree and Hawa السلام, ate from that tree because for that brief moment, Allah Ta'ala was forgotten from the heart. And the first response was, Rabbana. Oh Allah, I remember all of who you are for me and all of who you are for creation and all of who you are for, 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 for my family. That there is not a leaf that falls except by your permission. That there is not a single creation that, that foot strikes the earth except that you Allah know of its whereabouts, know of where this creation is trying to go and you Allah are the one who provides for it and, over, uh, and oversees its care. That Ya Allah, you are my Lord. And the beginning of dua is remembering that Allah is my Lord and yours. And Adam السلام, is showing us that when people sin, they respond healthily or toxically. The healthy response is to lean into Allah. The toxic response is to lean away from Allah. And Adam السلام, in a matter of a moment, he ate from the tree and he leaned into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We got to ask ourselves, when we sin, do we lean in or do we lean out?
Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam, he does that, and we mentioned before in the detox years that we were doing, that there are three realities that lead the servant to be at a great maqam with Allah. And the first is i'tiraf ma'rifati haqiqatillah. To know the reality of Allah, the word Rabbana. You know, if you go to the streets of Yemen, and you go to Hadramaut, and you sit after Fajr and some of the masajid, you will see groups of children, three years old, five years old, seven years old, sitting, and their sheikh, their guide will tell them, all I want you to do for the next 20 minutes is to say, Ya Allah, to condition your heart and your soul to know that Allah is the only one worthy of you calling upon. And Rabbana, in the beginning of the du'a of Sayyidina Adam السلام, is an establishment of Ya Allah, the only one who can get me out of what I'm in is you. And the only reason, this is where it gets deep, the only reason why I am where I am is because I forgot you. The only reason why I am in the predicament I'm in is because, Ya Allah, I strayed away from you. And so now I'm coming back to you. And that's why the next thing that he did is after saying, Rabbana, he says, Zalamna anfusana. O Allah, we've wronged ourselves. When we apologize, sometimes we create a comparison of apologizing to Allah that, 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 that is jaded by what it means to apologize to creation. You see, we are used to apologizing to friends. If, 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 you're, on, if you're one of those good friends, you apologize to friends. We likely in our lives, especially as you get older, get more comfortable apologizing to your parents. Just by night and by day, just please forgive me. SubhanAllah, the closest, you know, we always, we'll talk about parents in a future session, but the closest dynamic that we have to observe is that between us and our parents as well, in terms of reverence. And we apologize to our parents that when you get older, you, stop apolog you start apologizing to them without like a, a, a direct circumstance, just defaultedly. Like you leave your parents, please forgive me. It's like, Nothing happened, bro, what's wrong with you? Just like, no, 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 just... Because I know that I generally fall short, please forgive me. When we apologize to Allah, we don't apologize to Allah because Allah is impacted by us. We apologize to Allah because we are impacted by us. We are impacted by us. Rabbana zalamna anfusana. Ma zalamna ya Allah. We have not wronged you, O oh Allah. You cannot be wronged. You cannot be impacted. You cannot be influenced. Ya Allah, in the process of disobeying you, in the process of turning away from you, the only one that was hurt and harmed and impacted was me. Zalamna anfusana. And that level of acknowledgement, that level of recognition, of saying that, Ya Allah, I have wronged me, is the core of the dua of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam. He says, I have wronged myself. And most people that struggle with dua, struggle with the ability to get past all the excuses, all the narratives, all the fun uh, stories that we make up as to why it's okay for us to do the things that we do. And those are lies that we tell ourselves to make the unacceptable normal. Adam السلام, could have said, it was shaitan. There's an external influence. There's an agenda. There's a plot. There's this guy. And he has no goal but to get me removed. And guess what? Adam السلام, would have been absolutely in the right to blame shaitan. And yet in the process of recognizing the role of shaitan, what did he not do? He didn't remove the responsibility of himself. And this is a powerful lesson because in his dua, Sayyidina Adam السلام, did not reference shaitan at all. He was fully aware, fully acknowledging the role that shaitan played that led him to eating from the tree. We don't need to dismiss the fact that bad friends lead us to bad decisions. We don't need to ignore the fact that people will lead us away from Allah, that places will lead us from Allah, that problematic tendencies will lead us from Allah. But Adam السلام, didn't even reference those things in his dua. He says, Ya Allah, my sin is a me problem. My sin is a me problem. 
And I can say that it's because my dad wasn't all that good of a person. I can say that it's because I went to like the public schools of Dearborn and God alone knows about the public schools of Dearborn. Like I can give all, I can write a whole book as to why I am the way that I am. But when I'm with you, Ya Allah, like my problems are my problem. And my sins are my problem. And guess what? ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا And not only that, وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ And oh Allah, if you choose not to forgive me because of who you are, and if you choose not to have mercy on me because of who you are, then I will, be not, I will not be anything but a loser in every element of who I am. That Ya Allah, you've given me so much wealth. You've given me so much health. You've given me so much freedom. But Ya Allah, if I don't have your forgiveness, then I have nothing. It reminds me of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. We've mentioned this before. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he stabbed, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the murder of Sayyidina Umar, he drinks the milk to see if he's, if, if he's going to be able to survive the wound and the milk seeps through and it goes out and they know that it's just a matter of moments. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he sends Abdullah ibn Umar to do two things. The first is to go ask Aisha if he can be buried next to Sayyidina Rasulullah and Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The other thing that he does is he tells Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar, his son, to help him get his head on the ground. And when he puts his head on the ground, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, is the people in his house are able to hear him. And he says, Woe to me if Allah chooses not to forgive me. Woe to me if Allah chooses not to forgive me. A few moments ago, we said Astaghfirullah about three times. And I wonder if in that three times, at a moment, we registered, what would happen if Allah chooses not to forgive me? Sayyidina Adam salam, when he eats from the tree, we eat questionable things all the time. We go to questionable places like that one tree we shouldn't go to all the time. We do things worse than what Sayyidina Adam salam, did all the time. But look at the dramatic, I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully here. Look at the dramatic response of Sayyidina Adam salam, when he took one single bite from one single tree in one single moment of forgetfulness. What does he say? He says, oh Allah, I wronged myself dramatically. I extremely transgressed in a way that displeases you. He just took a single bite from a single tree in a single moment in a single day. And he's saying, Ya Allah, I wronged myself dramatically and problematically. And oh Allah, if you choose not to forgive me and have mercy on me, then I am nothing but a loser. It's affirmation after affirmation that, Ya Allah, there are a lot of things that I can question in life, but no shadow of a doubt. Ya Allah, from this single sin, of this single moment of weakness, from this single experience of biting a single bite into a single fruit, Ya Allah, that moment was a moment that I transgressed in the most unacceptable of ways. And if you choose not to forgive me for this single sin, then I will be nothing without doubt but the biggest of losers. Not even that I will li or li that we will be losers, but that I will carry the title of being a loser. It's just like, yo, bro, chill out for a second. You just took a bite. We take bites all the time. We take a wrong look all the time. We listen, you know, we listen to wrong tracks all the time. We miss prayers all the time. Do we respond with the desperation, with the urgency, and let me be very direct, with the fear of unacceptance that Sayyidina Adam salam, did when he did that one single sin. Oftentimes, instead of normalizing righteousness, we've normalized sins in our life. And so when you look back, and you look at the times that you raised your voice at your parents, 
and you look at the times that you were disrespectful to your own children and spouse, when you think of the times that you closed the Qur'an too quickly and too harshly, and you went elsewhere but the house of Allah, we normalize those sins. When Adam السلام, from the single sin, he felt like if that sin is not forgiven, then I can't be anything but a loser. That is the type of calling that we make with Allah. And that's a place that takes a lot of ma'rifatillah, a lot of knowing the reality of Allah in the word Rabbana, remembering who Allah is, and then the knowing of the reality of ourselves. And not only that reality of Allah and that reality of ourselves, but the reality of this dunya. And part of the reality of this dunya is that this dunya will end. And الْيَوْمَ نَخْتِمُ عَلَىٰ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَتُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ Sayyidina Adam السلام, what must have he feared at that moment? What must have he feared at that moment? Standing before Allah in account. Standing before Allah for account. Because that moment defines who is the victorious and who is the loser. Every one of creation can think you're a winner. Every one of creation can think that you're at the top. But if on the day of judgment, Allah knows you to be a loser, then you and I will be nothing but losers. Part of the reality of this world is that it will end and we will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so recognizing through the time of, uh, recognizing through the time of sin that if you do not forgive us and if you do not have mercy on us, then we will be nothing but losers, is a reminder that there will be an accountability for every single thing that we do. And that's why one of the things that happens on the Day of Judgment, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us this moment, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is a hadith that's attributed to the Prophet ﷺ authentically, it's a beautiful hadith that we hear often, Ramadan is the time to visit the ahadith that we know. That is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws the believing woman and man near. And always, what did we say when we hear hadith? We imagine that the Prophet ﷺ sat you down like the Sahaba, like Mu'adh, right? Like Abu Bakr, and like he sat you down knee to knee. Think of your knee touching the knee of the Prophet ﷺ. Isn't that going to be so great? your knee touching the knee of the Prophet ﷺ, and he used to hold their hands when he would advise them, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, grant us the moment when we're holding the gentle and soft hands of the Prophet ﷺ. Grant us that moment. And the Prophet ﷺ's advice is from that heart, because it's not enough that the knees touch, and it's not enough that the hands are held. The hearts connect with the words of the Prophet ﷺ. When you look at the words of the Prophet ﷺ with your heart, Wallahi, you will feel a warmth, you will feel a love that goes beyond any love you've ever felt from your spouse or your mother or your father or your children. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, so, so two things that, that hadith does. One is it allows us to love the Messenger of Allah for his care for us. The other thing that it does is it allows us to remove the barriers between us and reality because the Prophet ﷺ, he was sitting in a gathering like this and there was a fire. And the Prophet ﷺ witnessed the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, such, such a strange uh, the, uh, sight of the, the flies and the wasps and the mosquitoes throwing themselves into the fire. And the Prophet ﷺ brought his hand forward to shade the insects the insects from throwing themselves into the fire and he says, I am like that for the Ummah of Muhammad He says, I am here to shade a people that act in such a way, that speak in such a way, that miss prayers in such a way, that abandon the Qur'an in such a way, that it is as if they wish to see themselves thrown in the hellfire. 
and I am here, and my sunnah is here to shield them from the hellfire. Wallahi, some of us live such a life, it's as if we are desiring for the fire of hell to be our abode. And the Prophet ﷺ's sunnah removes the facade and the barriers between us and seeing the realities that we talked about, the three realities. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he says, and I'll end with this hadith, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُدْنِ الْمُؤْمِنِ that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings forward the believer on the Day of Judgment. And, and the second thing that a hadith does is it allow, that, that part of it, removing the barriers is we see ourselves in the future on the Day of Judgment. Look at yourself through this hadith. Allah calls the believing woman and man forward and He draws you nearer to Him. And Allah begins to say, أَتَعِفُ ذَنْبَ كَذَا فِي يَوْمِ كَذَا يَوْمَ فَعَلْتَ كَذَا Think of yourself. Close your eyes if you have to. Allah Jalla Jalalu speaks to you. O Umar, O Muhammad, O Fatima, O Maryam. Do you remember this sin on this day, the day that you did such and such, again and again and again and again? And the servant of Allah says, Yes, my Lord. Yes, my Lord. Yes, my Lord. The hadith says, until the servant of Allah is completely drained of any hope, is left with zero hope, that they feel that they must be about to be told that they're destined for the hellfire. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَتَرْتُهَا عَلَيْكَ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَأَنَا أَغْفِرُهَا لَكَ الْيَوْمِ That I concealed it from the masses in the dunya, and today, I forgive you for it. And the, and the person, you my brother, you my sister, Allah Ta'ala, write us from those people. They're given their book of deeds in their right hand. This is what happens to the servant of Allah that turns to Allah in dua. Now, I don't talk about my sins to the public. I conceal my sins. And the first thing that I do, like Sayyidina Adam salam, is before the haram bite, before the haram gaze, before the haram walk is even settled, before it even sits in my stomach, or before it even settles in my vision or in my hearing, I turn to Allah. And I have a problem with the problem of Allah. And yet Allah, no excuses can make this anyone's problem but mine. Ya Allah, forgive me. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Immediately. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam and forgave Hawa alayhi salam.